Better yet, I use Chrome OS because I don't know what defrag is, right? There you are. There is, actually. Ooh. <laughs> All right, it uh, looks like we are live. Fantastic. Hello, welcome, everyone. Wow, we have a post-lunch coma crowd. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> perfect. Guys, we're getting recorded on YouTube and you're gonna be like, no, let's not talk to the presenter. That's horrible. Your, your voice will be recorded and saved for the annals of time. <laughs> Anyhow, hello everyone. Welcome today to Native Client Live. My name is Colt McCandless. I'm a developer advocate at, uh, at Google working on Native Client. I'm Noel Allen, the SDK lead. SDK lead, and we have fancy hats as well. Uh, we figured uh, the lights, these lights are actually pretty gnarly up here. We can't see people, so we're like, let's wear our hats. That'll be funny. <laughs> it actually kind of works because it's, right. it's a little bright. <laughs> okay, so what today's talk is about is we're actually going to port an application to Native Client live in 60 minutes. Now, just quick show of hands in here. How many have actually played with Native Client? Wow, that's actually a surprising amount of people. I'm, I'm very encouraged by that, actually. They'll know what we're talking about today. Um, funny story is we actually uh, decided to, to sign off to do this about uh, three to four months ago. And we said, uh, I actually walked into Noel's office and I was like, hey, we're going to give a talk at Google I.O. and we're going to port something to Native Client live in 60 minutes. And he was like, uh, no, you're not. And I said, yes, yes, we are. And so we got him to sign off on it. I convinced him with alcohol or something else. And uh, we started going through the process. And the truth was we failed. We failed a lot horribly, like crash and burn style. Well, right? you, you failed before I started. I mean, let's just get that clear. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough, we, that is true. Um, like the original port of the application we're gonna show you today uh, actually took about two and a half weeks the very first time we did it, which was kind of embarrassing on our side because it's a very simple piece of technology we're gonna look at today. Um, but the good news is that we actually learned from that. We said, where are we? This can't, you know, this isn't good for our developers. Let's improve the process. Let's improve the SDK, the workflow. And what we're gonna talk about today is the learnings the learnings of those things. So, how you should view today's uh, class session is a cooking show. How many people watch late night cooking? Really, that's it? The rest of you are liars, and you're dirty, filthy liars. If you do not watch Iron Chef, there is something wrong with you. That is an amazing show. <laughs> when, did, okay, that's. D oh, you kept changing the slides on me. I figured uh, I'd have some fun too. <laughs> that's new. Okay, we're going from there. Today is a cooking show, and we have Chef Noel Allen over here. Uh, what we're gonna do today, anyhow, in these shows, uh, you usually have some very uh, peppy person standing up there showing you how they're gonna make a lamb sorbet, uh, which is normally like a, a nine day or endeavor, and they're gonna do it in 30 minutes uh, and show you how to do it too. Well, we're gonna do the same process today. We're gonna take the knowledge and everything we've learned in the past couple of months and dissect it down. Now, we've had to pre-chop some onions so that we can get this in our 60 minute window here, uh, but we'll be sure to call that out so you know what was pre-chopped, what was canned, and what was actually fresh tuna fish for our lamb sorbet. And that hat is awesome. Where did you even find that? Uh, I got it at the store. Yeah. You oh, you have two? Oh, sweet. Uh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm getting fired. This is going to be awesome. How does it look? Very nice. I've, Very nice. Very convincing. I feel like I have a Pope hat. Sorry. <laughs> is this even on right? <laughs> I can't tell. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. The, we're wearing these now. Fantastic. I'm sure the YouTube guys love this. Okay. This is a cooking show with your chefs. So let's get started and talk about Native Client a little bit, sort of set the groundwork in the ecosystem of what we're talking about today. Native Client is a technology that allows you to run C and C++ code in a web page with the same safety as JavaScript. And here's the really cool part, is that the user is not required to install a plugin. So what we've seen is that with a lot of technologies out there, you can actually run C and C++ code in a web browser, but the user gets this really scary pop-up that's like, hey, you're about to install a plugin that's gonna violate every piece of data you have on your hard drive. What we've been seeing over time is that that, of course, affects user retention rates, right? Uh, the and user installation. Say again? And installation. And installation, exactly. So users get there and they go, hey, you know, this is too scary, and they move on. And so this means that high-performance applications that wanna run C++ code in a web page really lose a lot of their users to this scary dialogue. Now, with native client, C++ and the fact that it can be ran safely in the web browser and they're not in prompted to install a plugin, 
means that your C++ code can actually bridge a lot of ecosystems and a lot of platforms. So predominantly, C++ code was in the realm of game consoles, PC development, mobile, and now you can actually use your same code base right in the web, which is fantastic for a lot of companies and studios who spend a lot of time not only training their engineers in C++ code, but also you, know, you have legacy code. You've got 10 years of C++ memory management code, STL containers sitting around, and you don't want to throw all that out. Now, we had our official native client launch event in December of last year. Uh, in truth, native client was out for quite a while before that, but we decided to snazzy it up and actually have some more derves and call it a launch event. Since then, NACL has been doing fantastic. We've seen already 27 titles, actual products, ship with native client since the announcement. In addition to that, we've seen that game developers predominantly love native client. Uh, we see a lot of technology uh, middleware for, for games on the side there. They're finding that native client provides them this nice little niche between performance and reach. You can run all of your code extremely fast and reach all of the 310 million users that Chrome has active. That was a new stat today. Watch the keynote. So let's talk about what we're cooking today. Uh, let's switch this over to you. So uh, Chef Noel, can you show us what our lamb sorbet looks like today? Absolutely. So for today, we have a fabulous spinning cube. That wasn't what we looked at yesterday. What? Well, we, we still had a couple you know, bugs you issues. You didn't fix the bugs? We were supposed to have bugs. You were I buying was, the hats. I was busy. I had stuff to do. You I had a new busy. Nexus to play with. OK, fair enough. Cool, you had the Nexus. Awesome. So we're doing a spinning cube. So what is, what is this thing actually doing behind the scenes? OK, so this is an OpenGL demo. Right? It's a kind of standard demo that you do. Make sure your graphics engine is rendering correctly. So hence the arrows and the lighting and whatnot. Um, so this is a standard Windows 32 application. And we're going to port that to native client. And so this is doing just standard rendering. So we're reading in some shaders, reading some textures, doing some platform calls. Exactly. This is our lamb sorbet. Fantastic. So with that spinning cube up and running over there to distract all of you, I'm going to point over this way with sock puppets. Let's talk about our kitchen. Let's, uh, let's talk about what development with native client it should actually look like today for most of you. So uh, when porting to native client, you need to approach it from the concept of any other port. So let's say you're actually porting an application from Windows to Linux. Okay. This is going to have a specific set of processes that you're going to need to go through. First off, you're going to need to actually uh, change over from using DirectX to OpenGL. That's actually a big set of code, different APIs that aren't available on the Linux machines. Also, some APIs are only available on Windows for the same process, right? So you want to spawn up a thread. Well, on Windows, you'd use begin thread or begin thread EX. Um, on Linux, you would have to use sort of a more POSIX style of pthread create. And so other things, like Windows actually provides a very rich ecosystem for UI components that you can use as part of their platform that may not exist on other platforms like Linux. So instead of being able to actually use the message box function directly, you'd have to get shifted over to printf, right? So viewing your port to native client should be the same way. You should view it like porting from anything to another platform. But with native client, what you're actually porting to are these specific functions. You're actually porting to an API we call Pepper. Now, what Pepper is, is it's actually a plugin API that Chrome provides that allows plugins to interact with lower level system resources like file IO, rendering, audio, and even the ability to communicate directly to the JavaScript page. And it allows it to do this inside of the Chrome sandbox, which means that these plugins are actually communicating through the same exact code paths that JavaScript is communicating to to do the same functionality, right? Because this hat is awesome, by the way. Like, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I need like an ear in. It's like popping over my head. Sorry. Anyhow, native clients should be viewed as a plugin that's provided with Chrome, right? We, it's compiled with Chrome, it's shipped with Chrome. And the, what native client allows you to do is it allows you to load pre compiled executable code that can then target the Pepper APIs. It'll load it up, execute the code, and allow that code to actually directly trampoline over and get access to these lower level system resources. How this works at a developer level starts with your original C code. The C++ code is then sent through our custom GCC compiler provided by the SDK. This spits out a set of Nixie files, or native client exe files. These have been uh, munged and uh, sort of messed around a bit to ensure, uh, well, to do the best we can to ensure safety. Uh, we, reduce, uh, we remove a lot of malicious codes that, that may cause security vulnerabilities uh, and some other fun stuff that we'll talk about later. You take this data that's actually generated from the tool chain, and with a simple HTML embed tag, you can actually get it running right in your web page. So what you're actually seeing on the screen there is a screenshot from a game called From Dust. 
From Dust was actually an Xbox 360 title that was ported over to native client that we unveiled earlier this year. Now this is running the same shaders, the same code. Uh, it's actually doing quite amazing. I think I have this backwards. How about that? Is that better? You're like going to fiddle with this. The I, whole I am. It's, presentation it's, it's annoying me. I, my head's too small. And my ears are too big. That's the problem. So let's talk a little bit about the SDK. The SDK itself allows for cross-platform development on, on platforms for Linux, Windows, and Mac. And we do this through providing a simple command line GCC compiler. So the, the compiler itself is just a simple command line. Everybody in here has probably used GCC at, at one time in your programming life. We also provide a full set of uh, working code examples so that you can actually see how to properly use Pepper and how to use native client and best practices involved with that process. And then in addition to that, we also provide debugging and profiling tools that are currently in alpha rev of our SDK. Uh, now this, this takes a little bit to understand. So you need to know that when we generate these native client executables, the Nexi files, it's not your standard x86 code. Uh, we, there, we got a lot of paperwork that we're not going to talk about today so much that, that doesn't, it actually isn't a same, a, an exe that you can just double click on your desktop and run. It's actually a modified uh, dwarf file, right? Correct. Oh, actually, fantastic. Yeah. So dwarf no. OK, fantastic, which means that debugging uh, systems are, work a little bit differently, right? Like you don't have a, a PDB file full of symbols and all these other things. It, it requires some, some uh, massaging. Now, with these things in mind, let's talk about actually porting, because we've only got like 47 minutes left, and my hat is funny, and I'm running on reserve power. This isn't even plugged in. <laughs> if it was a perfect demo, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> so here's our plan of attack today. First, what we're going to do is we're actually going to build as a Pepper plugin first. Pepper's a fantastic API, but we're going to actually ignore the native client part of the equation and just migrate over our platform-specific APIs over to the Pepper APIs first. And then as a last step, we'll actually do the generation of the native client EXE. This allows us to actually use our plugin system in an existing IDE of choice, right? So standard plugin development is pretty much exposed in every IDE out there, right? It's a standard loop. You create sort of a DLL or an SO. The external application loads it up. You can set breakpoints, see memory, all this other fun stuff. Now, to facilitate this, and this is one of the biggest things that we learned in our failures that I mentioned earlier in this project, was that we really didn't have good integration into existing IDEs at the level we wanted to. So today, we're actually really excited to announce that we're actually providing a Visual Studio 2010 plugin for native client and Pepper. And we'll actually provide this, <laughs> please, yes, applause. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Plugins are awesome, or add-ins are awesome. Uh, this will be available in the Pepper 22 SDK. So if you guys go to gonackle.com, grab the SDK chain, you actually get a preview, because we allow, we actually have uh, a few Peppers ahead of stable available, yep. right? Canary builds and all the other stuff. Yep. Yeah, so this is actually available, and you guys can go take a look at it. So we're really excited about that, because it really helps with ease of use. Now, uh, <laughs> what Chef Noel is going to do today for us, uh, can you walk us through some of the things that the add-in does inside of Visual Studio? Sure, absolutely. So um, I have already created some different configurations. We can see a native client configuration, a Pepper configuration, and the original Windows 32 configuration. So what the add-in is doing is we can go over here and Um, so the add-in drives the compiler. Now for the Pepper configuration, it's actually pretty straightforward. All we're actually going to do is convert from an executable to a DLL. So Chrome's going to load this and run it as a plugin. Um, very little change. I'm just going to go ahead and point my include directories to the Pepper SDK. Hmm. Uh, I am going to create a uh, macro for Pepper so that I know in my code which particular view of the code I'm looking at. And that's pretty much it. I'm ready to go. Okay, fantastic. So you set up these properties. So you create the plugin, uh, or you create the platform, and then you compile, and what happens here? Great. So now I'm going to switch to the Pepper configuration, and I'm going to go ahead and relaunch. Now, I did actually do one other thing, which is for the sake of debugging, I set this up to uh, launch Chrome for me. Oh, okay. Now okay. I see some other flags in there. Can you walk us through what exactly Sure. Is going so there's on? a couple flags in here that make things a little bit easier for you. So I am setting user data to not pollute my normal user uh, settings. I have incognito to let Chrome forget what I've done so we don't actually get caching effects. Um, and then register Pepper plugin. Here's the interesting one where I am telling Pepper, please, or I'm telling Chrome, please load this plugin and then I want you to answer any requests to the particular MIME type I have described here, which in this case is application xnackle. 
Interesting. So to be very clear about this, what happens is anytime Chrome actually encounters the MIME type application NACL, it'll actually go load the native client EXE and pass the data over to it. What this uh, command line option allows us to do is override that process. And so instead of actually finding uh, MIME type NACL and running NACL, it's going to run our plugin instead. Exactly. Okay. All right. So we can go ahead and launch that. Okay. And oh, helps if I start the web server first. <laughs> Always useful. <laughs> All right. Now, it couldn't find the plugin. So why is it saying that, though? Well, I am missing the components that let Pepper talk to the plugin. Uh, I see. So we had our Win32 code. So even though we've compiled it as a DLL, we haven't had it, the hooks, the API hooks exactly. for Pepper for Chrome to actually load. So, exactly. So where do we get those, and how do we get those? OK, well, the easiest thing to do is I am just going to sit here and go over to one of the examples that we ship and just copy and paste it in so that I have all that uh, startup code. I like your style. What is that all they right. say, that uh, good programmers code and great programmers reuse? Sort of thing? I like it. OK, so if we take this Hello World example, and I'm going to select that and paste it here into the bottom, and then run again. OK, so now we can see the Hello World demo that ships with the SDK. And that's running in our existing code. Correct. So but where'd the spinning cube go? Well, we haven't called it yet. So we haven't actually called any of the original code that we had. Uh, OK, can you I can, can you make do it? that real quick. OK, you can do that. Awesome. OK, so if I come up here and just say, now, really quick, while you're scrolling up here, what, what are these functions we're looking at? These are Pepper functions, right? So these are Pepper functions. So um, as I said, there's three functions that we look at. We have like a module initialization, we have an API request, and we have a shutdown function. Uh, one of the requests that we, uh, one of the APIs that gets requested is uh, an API for your interface. So you're going to provide functions that Chrome can call into uh, to do things. And one of those is this did create, which is, which is very similar to, to the regular main mm. function. OK. So from there, I'm actually going to call into the original win main. And now we've got our box, but no alert. Interesting. OK, so what we're seeing here, though, is really cool, because we're actually seeing Win32 code running side by side as launched from a plugin inside of Chrome. So now we can call this code because we're actually running on a Windows system. Exactly. OK. So the goal here is to actually get that spinning cube running in the web page. So we've got all that stuff set up. The next steps for us are that is to actually port over to Pepper. Now, uh, when understanding the Pepper API, it's important to understand how an application communicates with a plugin to kind of give a little bit more visibility into what it's doing. So let's say we've got our Chrome, Chrome and let's say we've got our plugin. Chrome, of course, will call init like it did. And then the plugin will go do some processing. Now, in order for the plugin to get a sort of persistent heartbeat, right, because this is a plugin, we can't just allow yourself to go call code into it, otherwise you'll never receive execution control back into Chrome. So once the plugin's done, it can actually tell Chrome, hey, can you call me again in like 10 minutes or you know, whenever you get some time? And so what'll happen is the plugin, and uh, Pepper specifically, provides APIs that allow you to push a callback up into Chrome. And then Chrome can run off, do some processing, render a web page, uh, you know, check your, your local listings for cars and, and salty pork products. Uh, and then when it gets around to it, it can actually call that callback, giving execution control back to your plugin. And of course, your plugin does some processing, and the cycle repeats. And this is kind of as close as you can get to actually having a while loop inside of Pepper or inside of a plugin, right? We allow you to kind of get this uh, processing over time. Now, uh, let's talk about a couple roadblocks you're going to run into when working with Pepper. First off is all of the APIs for Pepper are non-blocking. And you can see why when looking at it as a plugin API. If one, of these pe if one of these APIs were blocking, what would occur is that you can effectively stall out all of Chrome because execution control goes into the plugin, and then they, Chrome won't get any more time slices to give to V8 or anything else. And so you get that nice little aw snap little sad face dude. My heart always breaks when I see him. I'm like, oh, he's so sad. Don't worry, the internet is still there. <laughs> Anyhow, second off is that Pepper APIs can only be called from the main thread. This is another restriction that we enforce to ensure sort of stability and security over time. And then finally, that there's really no main loop in Pepper. As you can see, based upon the APIs, that you can't actually just create a, a while loop and sit there and spin. Now, I want to point out that this is sort of temporary restrictions as of Pepper 21. 
our, the team is working very, very hard at removing these restrictions, including the ability to call Pepper from any thread in your environment, which will be a huge step forward for those of you who have done development. So let's talk about the call loop a little bit more and, and why exactly we didn't see the plugin, but we did see the cube. So what exactly happened was this. Chrome called init and gave execution control to the plugin. Well, the plugin at that point actually called into Windows and said, hey, let's go run this. Now, Windows being Windows code effectively sucked up all of the processing time, and we actually didn't ever give execution control back into Chrome, right? So WinMain has a little while loop in there where it processes events and message pumps and everything else that it passes to the window, and we were never actually able to give control back into Chrome, so we starved it out. Um, but you guys didn't see the all snap sad face because we didn't hit the timeout period for the demo. Our floppy hats kept us from doing that. <laughs> so uh, in order to fix this, though, uh, Chef Noel, Chef, Chef Nolington III, uh, can you show us how you, how you address this issue? OK, so here are a couple of changes that I'm making. Um, so we want to break that main loop into two separate pieces, the initialization piece and the actual loop. Mm. Um, so I am going to if def out the loop and instead put it in a new function. And I'm going to have that function request to get more execution time by calling by, by asking Pepper, please call on the main thread this function again at a later time. And so this is the function that allows, that, that effectively pushes the function pointer back into Chrome? Correct. OK. Excellent. So then what's this look like? Well, let's fire that up. So we get the pop-up, and we get the cube. So the execution happens side by side. Fantastic. So uh, now that that's kind of handled, and we know that we're actually not stalling out Chrome, and we have execution control being handed back to the main application, let's actually talk about loading files. Now, native client is an internet technology, which means that it's served from a web server somewhere, and the client is going to make a request to pull things down. Now, anytime you have communication between client and server with a web browser, we'll talk about Chrome just to limit our scope of discussion here, um, when a page load request occurs, Chrome, on your behalf, will go ahead and fetch uh, specific files and store them in Chrome's cache, which means it'll grab HTML files, it'll grab Nixie files, and the native client manifest file, the NMF file. Now, this will be stored in the cache on your behalf, which is fantastic, because if you have uh, executable code sitting on a server somewhere, it's probably between the range of you know, 5 to 13 megabytes, and you don't want the user to have to keep grabbing that code and pulling it down every time they hit refresh. Now, uh, the bad part about this, though, is that Chrome won't go fetch all of those other files which are usually required by your application. You've usually got a bunch of binary data. Uh, if you're a game developer, you've got textures, assets, um, you know, map data, XML information, all this other sort of stuff. Now, to grab that data, and that's specifically what we're going to focus on today, Pepper provides an API called GetURL. GetURL, again, being a server technology, or being an internet technology, says, hey, uh, here's a URL. Go fetch me the bits of this. So in JavaScript, this would be equivalent to an XHR, XHTTP request, right? So everyone in here is a net developer. You should grok that. I see one head nodding. I like your style. Can I nod with this and that actually work? Maybe. Everyone on YouTube just jumped. Cool. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, in addition to that, uh, because you can actually pull down this data, again, that's not cached on your behalf, so you actually have to have an answer for that, because again, if the user reloads your page, you're going to have to go grab another 40 megs worth of data every time they do that. To address this, Pepper actually provides another API called the File Store API. So you can actually grab your data and write it to the persistent sandbox file storage on disk. This way, when the user closes Chrome, reloads the page, goes on vacation for 15 days, that data will still stay on disk that you can pick up and grab later. So there's a great place to put save state, uh, user preferences that you may not want to sync to the cloud, or just, again, you know, the 80 megs of bi binary data that you'll have that, that's needed for your application. Now, uh, one thing we talked about earlier was that the Pepper APIs are non-blocking. So for all of you who have used fread, <laughs> uh, we can't use that in native client, because that would actually stall the system, wouldn't really just control back to Chrome. So we actually don't allow you to use that command. You have to use get URL. And any of you who've done asynchronous file loading know what this looks like. Effectively, we have an init phase. The init phase will kick off an open URL command to the server, and say, or to Chrome, uh, and say, hey, you know, go load some data. Uh, then our plugin will actually go into a loader loop phase. What we're going to do is we're effectively going to spin, or what well, we can't exactly spin, but we're going to go through a process of allowing Chrome to do call on main thread and allowing the plugin to relinquish control, gain control, et cetera, et cetera, until Chrome actually tells us the file has actually been opened. Chrome will signal to us and, and give us a specific call. Once we've received the file open command, we then can issue a read bytes and say, hey, you've opened the file, please give me some data. And then we can continue this loop until the data has actually been fetched. And this is the standard sort of loader loop that we're going to work through here. 
Once the data's been fetched, you, or preloaded everything, you can then move on to your actual render loop and start drawing the cube on the screen. Uh, so, <laughs> you haven't seen that one yet, have you? You know I'm allergic to fish. Really? Yes. <laughs> that makes it even awesomer. Now I'm gonna itch. So now. by the way, don't Google man-hugging fish. <laughs> Different sort of results that you get there. Anyhow, um, <laughs> your royal majesty Nolington Shefton III, uh, can you please walk us through what this sort of file IO asynchronous stuff looks like in our demo? Sure. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to request for these assets to get loaded in the background. And we're gonna do that by first issuing an open, as you described, which is basically a get request to the asset. Once that open completes, it's gonna call us back. And then in that callback function, we're gonna record the size of the object that we're getting, we're gonna allocate memory for it, and then we're gonna start reading bytes. And again, this happens as a callback. So mm -hmm. uh, every time we get some bytes back, we're then gonna call this other function, which is going to store it in that uh, block of memory that I allocated. And eventually, when I get enough of it, I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a callback to let me know that it's there. And when it's there, I'm simply gonna increment a global counter that says, hey, I got another asset. Now, to be very clear, uh, we know that all of you have very sophisticated code bases and asynchronous file loading is probably part of your general platform library. We are not at all advocating this as best practices for loading files on the internet. Please write a good asset manager with mutexes and callbacks and everything else. Like, don't just use a counter. That's a really just a bad idea. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to give the disclaimer. Yes, Otherwise, it'll show up like, you know, Google says you should just use a counter to load all of your files with native clients. Yes, well, the, we, the ugly counter hack is in fact right here, <laughs> okay. which is, uh, we're gonna call the initialization program. So I've, I've changed this main loop. So uh, we do the initialization, and then once we actually discover three assets, then we're gonna switch to rendering. But in either case, we're just gonna go back and ask for more processing time every time we go through the loop as normal. So effectively, if we haven't loaded it yet, we still submit our call on main thread so we can get processing in the future to determine if it's all loaded. Correct. Okay, and then once the things are loaded, we go to our render loop at that point. Exactly. And so, so this has changed. Let's see this live. Okay, so it looks much the same, but if we go over here and look at the web server, you can see that originally uh, we were getting, oops, hold on, ran the wrong file. Stop it, stop it all. Hit the oh, buttons. Please stop. Quick, click more. Panic click, panic click. Take evasive action. Scatter. You're not being helpful. Just <laughs> I know. <laughs> why don't you know you're not being helpful? <laughs> okay. So uh, as we can see here, um, we now actually see the requests for those assets coming into the web server. So we have successfully moved over to serving the data from the web. Awesome. So as a Pepper plugin, we we're actually able to just use fread and actually load the data. But as part of the Pepper API, you can see that we're fetching it right from the server. You need, to, you need to like nod with authority. I need to, and I need to, is my hat not correctly flipped? Well, you have hair, and so it keeps it from sliding around. Ah, That's my yes. problem is the, the balding thing. Anyhow, <laughs> so once we've got a rendering with our simple example, the next step is actually to get us porting from OpenGL, which is desktop GL, to GLES2, which is the API that we provide a native client that allows you to do fancy rendering of cube with arrow texture. I really think we should have done the other demo. You should have fixed stuff instead of playing with your new hardware. So what we're gonna do today is we're not gonna talk about the actual porting process of GL to GLES. There's a lot of documentation out there on how to actually do this process. GLES 2.0 is very dominant on mobile devices right now, and if you just Google, for, don't Google for manhugs fish, instead Google for G, desktop GL to GLES 2, you'll find much more useful information in that process. We are gonna note a couple things that are different between the two, just so if you've never actually dealt with OpenGL ES 2.0, you're aware of some of the things you're gonna run into moving forward. Uh, first off, they're not the same thing. The predominant one is that GLES2 can be considered a subset of GL. The most shocking change there is that GLES2.0 has no fixed function support. So in, ader, in order to draw a polygon or set some state or even get a texture on screen, you have to provide a vertex shader and a pixel shader. If you've never written a vertex shader or a pixel shader, don't worry, the internet can help you, uh, which I find I need on my business card. Like, don't worry, the internet can help you. 
In addition to that, there's a different shader syntax. When you actually do write your shader for this system, because standard GL does support uh, shaders, uh, the syntax itself is, is different. So you have to set different precision values for uh, your, your pixel shaders, uh, as well as some other nuances with how you handle skinning and uh, constant register access. And probably the, one of the interesting things is because GLES 2.0 is actually a subset of GL, uh, some things that you'd normally have to go to GL and fetch extensions for, you no longer have to. So with standard desktop GL, you would have to go grab an extension to actually do multiple render targets or to do uh, deferred rendering or some other interesting things. With GLES 2, a lot of that stuff is just provided natively, which is fantastic. There is one API we're gonna talk about today, though, and this is really the only thing that's pepper-specific in the translation from GL to GLES, and that is a function called swap buffers. So what happens is when you're doing your render loop, you're gonna render some polygons, you're gonna set some state, set some textures, blow up some aliens, do really cool stuff. From there, you're actually gonna call the swap buffers API. Now, typically, what swap buffers will do with the GL API is it'll actually trigger off a command to the device driver and to the GPU to swap the uh, front screen with the back screen. So when you actually do your rendering, all of the commands are actually compositing to uh, a buffer that's not currently displayed to the user. And the swap screen command tells it to say, hey, now swap it so the user can see the work that you've all done. The swap buffer command provided with Pepper, uh, part of our header suite, actually contains an API, or uh, sorry, it contains a function that allows you to actually kick off your callback. So typically, like we said before, you're gonna need to use a call on main thread so that soon, sometime in the future you'll get, um, you'll get called again. The swap buffers API sort of encapsulates these two concepts into a single call. So you can actually kick off your swap buffer call as well as push your function pointer back into Chrome. Now, if you're doing rendering, you should consider this the end of your pepper frame, right? Because you know, if you've called swap buffers, it's time to relinquish control off to Chrome. Chrome's gonna do some cool stuff, fix the internet, make everything amazing. Um, and do it really fast. And then eventually it'll come back and call your function because you've passed it off and that's your start of your frame again. So this is really the only difference. Like it, everything else is a standard GL to GLES port. This is the one thing you need to be aware of. So you've done, we have, we're not talking about GL to GLES. So these are, this is the chopped onions part of the talk, right? Like we're not gonna walk you through that change. We've already got it live. Can you show us what that looks like? Sure thing, okay. So here is the change that we discussed, the swap buffer. And I am going to go ahead and run this. Very cool. So we're actually running in the web page. We now have our cube in the web page. Uh, very cool. I like that. So now, quick question here: uh, If we actually are, if we're actually creating a Pepper plugin, and we can actually get it to run in the web page like this and do full graphics and high precision timing and everything. Why are we even messing with Knackle? Why don't we just ship a Pepper plugin and that's our product? Well, first, uh, Chrome isn't going to let you just load some random plugin. Uh, native code is kind of a ugly, unsafe thing. So <laughs> we want to make sure that we take care of it correctly. So in order to use that C and C++ code, you're going to want to ship that as an XE so that you get that extra protection. So you're saying that uh, me downloading an arbitrary plugin from uh, Bob's Hugging Fish website is not necessarily a safe thing to do? Yeah, especially not the websites you go to. Okay, well, let's edit that part out of YouTube, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the next step then, since we actually don't want to provide just a plugin to the masses, because again, that'll come back to the point, the user will get that really nasty pop-up that says, hey, uh, Bob's Hugging Fish Basement really, really like to install some things on your computer, which never click okay to that. What we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna do the final step of our process of our creating our lamb sorbet and actually go and compile our code with native client, generating the proper Nixie files that can be distributed on the internet. So now recall this graph here is that native client is a plugin that's provided with Chrome that allows external compiled code to effectively call the APIs that allow secure sandbox execution to lower level system resources. Now, the plug or the add-in for Visual Studio provides some specific um, nuances that we should talk about here. What the Visual Studio plugin does at this point in time, because debugging and profiling support is still in alpha, the add-in actually doesn't allow you to set breakpoints and do debugging inside of Native Client yet. It's coming soon, stay tuned. Follow me on G+. Uh, what it does now, though, is it'll actually scrape the Visual Studio properties on your behalf and create the proper command line that's required to send off to GCC. GCC, of course, will then uh, produce the Nexi from our SDK and then output any information for command line errors or processes back to Visual Studio. So the good thing is, 
If you're a Visual Studio developer, or you've got a lot of legacy code there, this allows you to operate and compile with Native Client in a way that feels very natural to you, uh, save for the breakpoints and the debugging. But again, that's in alpha. We're working very hard on that, right, Noel? Exactly. Noel's actually the guy heading that up, right? Yep. Your hat is heading that up, actually. My, my the, hat is in charge. Your hat is in charge my of, of charge. debugging. See, it's still, it's floppy. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, this is actually my favorite picture in the deck, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. 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 I like nice. it's, it's the salt head. That's, we, did, we did a rehearsal of this a couple weeks ago, and someone said, you should probably Photoshop some salt shakers in there. And I was like, okay, well, here's a salt head. Anyhow, uh, so we have, part of our add-in allows the pepper configuration as well as the NACL configuration. So can you show us the NACL config and what it does? Absolutely. Okay, so again, from the add-in that you'll get in Pepper 22, um, you can go ahead and set up for a native client configuration, okay? And as Galt said, this is going to drive that GCC toolchain for you. And then we have, you know, the standard kind of settings. Again, I'm going to use Chrome as the application that I'm actually going to run. And I am going to set some additional flags. I'm going to set my include directories. I'm going to set my... Uh, library paths, you know, all the standard things um, that you would set, you know, for, for using an SDK. Okay. And we can take a look at that. Uh, so now, once you, mm -hmm. once you create, I mean, once you create the configuration, is there anything else, or can we actually just run live? Like, will it do a lot of automation for you? Well, what will end up happening is if we try to run it right now, we still have that, you know, Windows window and some, you know, other stuff that we need to clean up, so we'd actually get a lot of compile errors or link errors or whatnot. So we still have to get rid of those platform-specific things uh, to Windows. Okay, let's let's uh, let's take a look at that, or at least can you point them out or make sure. a right change? Sure. So let me uh, show you kind of the changes that we had to do here. So we need to, you know, obviously no longer include the Windows header because that's <laughs> not going to work, uh, or the Windows libraries. Okay. We need to stop calling main because that had a lot of Windows code in it. So instead, we just call the initialization function directly, and we need to uh, no longer uh, use those old uh, GL calls and things that were um, pointing to, you know, screen resolution and things like that that were described in Windows. So basically the WGL calls. Got it. Okay. Got it. So once those have all been if deft out, then we're actually ready to make that change. Okay, cool. So we're actually, uh, we're, we've converted all of our stuff over to Pepper, so we're using those API calls. We've also removed any platform-specific code from our application at this point, right? That's the good thing. And so now we can actually run... Okay, so this is the Pepper version, and now I'm going to switch to the native client version, rebuild, and you can see in the output window the toolchain running. Uh -huh. And now we have the cube actually running as a native client module. Fantastic, perfect. That's cool. And you can see the uh, load is right here of the Nexus. Excellent, excellent. So now, uh, with the Visual Studio plugin, right, because we want to empower developers to do great things, you can actually swap back and run the original Win32 as well still, right? Uh, exactly. So the Windows 32 version is still available, so I will switch back to that. And here we are. Really? You, you, look, you honestly went to my G Plus stream and pulled down a picture of me eating barbecue hey, in Austin, Texas. You put it up there, anybody can get access to it. What do you want? <laughs> There's a great, <laughs> you didn't do this yesterday. <laughs> okay, awesome. That's a great barbecue place in Austin, Texas. I highly recommend you going to it. Um, <laughs> stop going to my G Plus page. I'm gonna put you in a separate circle. You don't get any access to photos. I lost myself. What are we talking about? Um, okay, Win32. So this is the original Win32 application, right? Fantastic. <laughs> okay, it's mesmerizing. Actually, I find it a little disturbing <laughs> myself. <laughs> I'm very disturbed right now. So fantastic. So we've done the port. We actually have, uh, according to that timer back there, we got 20 minutes left. So even with me blathering on about all this other stuff about native client, uh, we've been able to chop some onions, dice some things up. The power of the Visual Studio add-in actually propelled us to do a lot of these things that you do it in a faster manner. A lot of the heavy lifting was done by the plugin or by the add-in. Uh, Pepper was really the, the hard place that we had to do some API conversions. Now, what we didn't talk about today was anything under the hood of native client. Today's talk has been specifically focusing on the developer side of things. Now, if you're interested in what Native Client is doing under the hood, 
to make sure that you can run native code in a browser with the same security and safety as JavaScript, I highly recommend you check out Nick Bray's talk on life of a native client instruction. Uh, it's happening today, in fact. He is actually going to pull back the mask of running x86 code in the web and talk about all the bad things it can do and how native client addresses those issues. So I highly recommend checking out his talk. So what did we learn today? Let's talk about this, the leftovers. So develop as a Pepper plugin first. This is going to allow you to use your existing IDE. It's going to allow you to develop as a plugin, which a lot of developers are familiar with. And it's allowing you to use the debugger properly. Now, again, you can use debugging and profiling with native client, but they're very alpha right now. So if, you, you know, if you're used to using Visual Studio all the time, you're probably going to have a lot of teeth gnashing in that process. Instead, use your IDE, get everything ported over to Pepper, make your big code changes there. Never underestimate the power of a good platform wrapper, right? Because all the platform code that effectively you're using in, for Pepper, you should properly abstract out. So when you're about to jump in the code and be like, I'm going to do native client, uh, stop hammer time, think about it, and then you say write a good wrapper so you can actually maintain your backward compatibility to the other SKUs that you're targeting. Uh, we ported File.io, we ported GL to GLAS, and then we removed all of our uh, platform-specific stuff from NACL, and we did it with really cool-looking hacks. <laughs> I'm still amazed you found these. <laughs> and with that, we're done with the port. I'm Colt McCandless. I'm Noel Allen. That's porting in 60 minutes, and uh, we'll open the floor for some questions right now. You did good. You did good. You did good. Should we? <laughs> I don't know if I should curtsy. I don't, I don't do that funny bow. Isn't that I'd with the hat? Probably just fall right over. No, probably. It's, we're a little bit top heavy. So th there's some microphones here. If you got some questions, please uh, feel free to speak up. Yes, sir. Well, no, um, the guy behind you. No, I'm just messing. With you. Sorry. The hat. It's it gives me power. <laughs> um, I was wondering if uh, there are any plans to be able to target Pepper to uh, like native binaries, so that I could use the same APIs for deploying to NACL and to deploying to just an application running on there and not have that uh, if deft out Win32 code? Uh, that's actually a great question. Uh, I'm going to let you field this. Yeah, actually, I, could you repeat that again? Because I'm not sure exactly what you were asking there. Can you take a binary that's already compiled? Or? So no. So I mean, the question is, like, um, you've been porting the, the app to use these Pepper APIs mm -hmm. instead of using the native Windows APIs. Um, is there any plans to cre create kind of a wrapper that's just like it's the Pepper API, but it uh, targets Windows functions instead of the Chrome so functions? We could, so we could use fread and under the hood it would do the right Pepper thing. Right. Yes. Gotcha. Um, yes, yeah, so actually uh, there's some stuff already out there uh, that other people have developed, uh, but we're actually putting in a subset of that into the SDK uh, as we speak. So you can expect to see things like, you know, pthread wrappers, um, access to, you know, fread, open, close, you know, the, the standard kind of posix -y things, except running in Win32 so that you can take that native client application and then run it as a Pepper plugin so that you can do your, your development a little bit easier. So, so the question I have is about the transition from the no sandbox to the sandbox. Uh, so basically, obviously, since you were using uh, Windows calls, you, you use the no sandbox uh, call initially uh, when you did the and you just made it a, a, a Pepper plugin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so where, is it, where does the transition happen? So when you, when you actually make it a Nexi, uh, and when you download it is, it, is it that the MIME type is handled by the native client? Uh, uh, so where, where does the transition to the sandbox happen? Where did, the, where did that, did, when, you run it, when you ran it finally, did you also run it with no sandbox? OK, so um, what the no sandbox does is it takes out that Outer Chrome sandbox. Yeah, I know what no sandbox does. Uh, yeah, I was just explaining it for everybody. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of other people in the room who may not know. But, uh, but what that uh, what that outer sandbox does is um, it gives you that OS protection, so it interferes with things like debugging. Okay, so I have the no sandbox off to enable me to debug at every single step. Now, when you actually deploy it, so if I took this application, I can switch it back to native client. Go over here to properties, debugging. And as you can see, I do not have no sandbox set at this point. Okay, so I'm actually running it with with the sandbox on. Right. So that was my question. So uh, so how does this actually work in the sense that so when the when the page actually loads, it, does it have a MIME type that is whatever application slash xnacl, and that's that's handled by whatever the NACL uh, processor inside Chrome? Yeah, so remember early on in the talk, we talked about using the embed tag to actually signify and point to the native client manifest, and we define the MIME type there. And then when the page is parsed by Chrome, it'll say, hey, we found this MIME type, and it has a table that says, load this plugin to handle this MIME type. 
Correct. So the uh, application XNACL typically points to the native client plugin, um, but we were overriding that for the purpose of developing as a Pepper plugin um, to make it easier. We, we were hacking the planet. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if there's plans to get this in the mobile version of Chrome, and if so, when? Um, I actually don't know, so <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Uh, <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I, I got no answers for you today, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, okay, then maybe is the, is the Nexi format very specific to x86, or is it something like LLVM that might be able to be compiled gotcha. for a, a so, so that's a, so let me, let me uh, kind of rephrase that question today. Um, so what you're looking at right now is specifically an x86 64-bit binary that was generated by the tool chains, yeah. okay? So if someone had a 32-bit version of the browser, then they would be using the 32-bit version, or if they had an ARM, they'd be using the ARM version. Um, now, we are working on a portable version, okay, that will, in fact, use LLVM to uh, generate bit code, and then we will do the translation uh, at the browser for you. So uh, you can expect that to be coming around, like, say, end of the year. Great, thank you. Yeah, hi there. Uh, if I have a, a pretty sophisticated Pepper plugin already made, um, well, I guess my question is, do I, uh, do I have full ac access to all the Pepper APIs in, inside NACL, or is it some subset? It is a subset, um, but it's almost all. Um, so there's a, there's a few uh, private interfaces that are only usable by a few uh, uh, different plugins. So unless you were one of those special cases already, you wouldn't have had access to it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I noticed you took out two of the libs. Um, if I have an external lib, I need to uh, recompile that lib as a NACL, is that correct? And then statically link it? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you were asking, what do you have to do with the two libraries? So the libraries that we see here that I took out is uh, the Windows GL libraries, okay? <coughs> Since we're GLES, you're mm -hmm. gonna be using GLES. Now, uh, as you can see here, what I'm doing is I am loading the uh, PPAPI version of the GLES2 library. So you will get this in the SDK, um, in the native form for your platform. So, you know, Windows, uh, uh, Mac, Linux. Um, and of course, the, the GCC tool chain ships with it as well. So you'll have it on all the platforms. Um, and we do actually ship the source for this library, so you could actually recompile it yourself if you wanted to as well. And if you, if you have libraries, you do have to recompile them, uh, because otherwise it may have unsafe code, or some, you know, it may use fread or try to open a window, and that would, of course, fail the validation. Cool, I'm sure there's an example I can follow. That sounds great. Um, the other question was, um, now that Chrome is in Android 4.1, is native client also runnable through that Chrome version? I believe the current answer is no. Uh, that, that because remember, Chrome on, on Android is, uh, doesn't have all of the, the big whiz-bang features today. We want to, of course, as Chrome, move towards having uh, feature parity as m in many places as we do. Right now, we actually don't have native client running on Chrome. Yeah, currently this is a desktop only. Yeah, it's currently desktop only. Fantastic, going once, going twice. Thank you guys for your attention today, we appreciate it, thank you.